Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Clio Talk. My name is Matt. And I'm RC. Anyway, uh, let's get into it. How, how have you been today? I've been okay. That was not our best transition. <laughs> no, it was not. Anyway, uh, th don't you love how hot it's been? I am legally required to say, yes, I love the rising temperatures. It makes so many areas of the country more uh, habitable because it is hot. I was talking to my boss at work and she was just like, yeah, you know, I, I went to Ari she went to Arizona for like a trip or whatever. And she's just like, yeah, it, it was really nice because it, we, it was like a dry heat. And I'm just like, ooh, I mean, it's been like a hundred and like 15 degrees where there's reports of people like getting burns from laying on the sidewalk. I saw that too. It's yeah. not, it's not a like, ooh, fun. This is like a dry, I don't like I kind of understand dry heat. I mean, I've been to New Mexico. I haven't been to Arizona, but in New Mexico. And like, I kind of understand that. I've been to, when you're in Vegas, if you ever go to Vegas, you'll understand it. Right when you get out of the airport, it's like, oh, this is dry heat. My eyes are burning. <laughs> Man, I, I, I. It's, it's like Arizona, all those areas where it's like, like Phoenix, mm -hmm. where it's like you build in the desert, you build a city in the desert, but you don't. They don't seem to have built much, and I've never been there, but they don't seem to have built much infrastructure to help with the fact that it gets to be 115 regularly before climate change. Phoenix is an affront to God, and I agree with King of the Hill when they uh, say that Phoenix shouldn't exist. And it is a place where basically the only way you can get around is yeah. in an air-conditioned box. It's like, what if we designed the city where it's already too hot to exist outside and you have to drive everywhere, but you still have to get out of your car and walk to the place you want to go. So it's like, it's already built in that there is a permanent, you have to get out of your car and walk versus mm -hmm. it, just building like, like an airport train where it just is in the building. You don't ever have to get out. Like Minneapolis has those like skywalks and stuff, you know? Yeah. Or, or Vegas where it connects through the casinos, right? Yeah, exactly. No, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, Vegas has the, the monorail where you don't even have to... It goes from New York to uh, whatever the other one is, the the, you, the the dome, the sphere. The sphere. You can also uh, ride in the Tesla. Yeah. But like uh, the climate change stuff is terrifying. Mm -hmm. absolutely terrifying i have no idea what to well, what to do just you know the concept of the wet bulb temperature being a thing that we have to worry about now or that a surface level ocean temperature was uh, described as hot tub temperature yeah, 101 baby let's go whereas and i have a friend who frequently touts uh him moving to seattle as being a climate change refugee 40 years early and it's just like, I mean, going somewhere doesn't really change the fact that we're all stuck on this blue rock together. So I do hate to point out that he flies back to KC all the time. So he can't move somewhere across the country for climate change reasons and then proceed to fly back to where you used to live constantly. You're, you're now omitting more than if you had never just never left. Like... We, <laughs> You are now the problem, but I, I was listening to an article on NPR uh, when I was coming home today, mm -hmm. and they were talking about how in some cities like Los Angeles or whatever, they're now, I don't think it's like white paint, but they're putting like some form of lighter color on the streets and stuff so that that problem you're talking about with the pavement burning you is slightly better. So it's just instead of it being like blacktop, it's like lighter top that you can still obviously drive in because if you know you just put white paint on it it'll be too slick it does beg the question of why are roads why didn't we do that earlier like that seems like the easiest possible thing is just make the roads lighter than black like don't just put asphalt like pure black tar down put put something slightly lighter because the roads have been hot forever how come nobody ever like thought about that they probably have. It's probably some sort of like manufacturer money issue or manufacturer issue. It's easier to do it in the actual color asphalt comes out at. Yeah, um, that is fair. But also in a jarring shift back to the Kansas City area, because this is based what this podcast is now. Did you see the statement about the new Royal Stadium? 
Uh, yeah, yeah. I think we've talked about our thoughts on that before, but let's talk about them again. Yeah, yeah. They're gonna put out a proposal. They're gonna finally unveil their proposal mm. uh, in September. Maybe the Royals will be at thirty wins by September. Who knows? Maybe they've been locked at twenty-eight wins for now. But I did see somebody just talk about how they're not really seemingly focused on the streetcar or other like actual public transit connections to their downtown stadium. They're still talking about t- like tailgating and parking and stuff. And I don't know about you. Do people tailgate at Royals games? I was just about to say that. I don't think tailgating is a big thing in baseball just because there's 180 games a season. Like like in a like a 18 game 17 game football season. Yeah, you can mm-hmm. tailgate, you know, you're every other week, whatever, that's fine, but it's like yeah, you want to show up on a Thursday night and get drunk in a parking lot? <laughs> like, <laughs> let's go, baby. I I can do that for free without paying for parking. Mhm. I just think John Sherman had an idea and had a lot of money and decided he was going to buy his way into this idea, but he did it like the year or two after he bought the team. Like he didn't build up any goodwill with the mm-hmm. city. You know, we've been losing since we won the World Series. I said Super Bowl since we won the World Series. Mm-hmm. We've just been losing. Well, the Royals have been losing since the Chiefs won the Super Bowl yes. as well. And it's like, I, I feel like you're a billionaire. You're not used to hearing the word no. You know, you're you're rich, whatever. But you could have at least built, like, put in some legwork of building up good, like, rapport. You know, maybe sign Shohei Atani. Maybe just sign some good players, get us winning a little bit, and then push the. Because just the it, it, we're it, gonna it, invest in the team, and it's like, guys, we've been losing. We we have not been winning since you did it. You reach out the staff. We're still losing, and now you want the city to spend a billion dollars on a new stadium. Is it your fault that I keep seeing the Shohei Otani has signed to the Royals post? Yes. God, <laughs> yes. Come on, we got to do it. <laughs> I know it's never ever ever gonna happen because he I think wants to move to like San Francisco or something but because he you know he's from japan he's japanese if you move to new york it's it's just adding hours on to the flight home so he doesn't really want to move to the east coast or anywhere but i, I just think it's like look i you know at a certain point you got to put your money where your mouth is right you got to like show that you're willing to invest in the team before you ask the city to invest in the team you know because he's not putting money into it why should we I don't I don't know, but he's gonna get uh the public you know, the public is gonna turn against him. You know, I would like a development that is good because I've been to uh I I've been to Target Field. Yes. Target Field's very nice. I've been to Coors Field. Coors Field although is one of the earlier examples of, the of the Cardinals, guy. right? No, Coors Field is uh, going to be the Rockies. Right. right. I, I, I guess I, not everyone probably is a baseball fan. Yeah. Target Field is the one in Minneapolis. In Target Field's in Minneapolis. Coors Field is in Denver. I've also been by Bush Stadium. I haven't been in it. That's the Cardinals Stadium. Yes. Uh, and it, like, f- just for example, because if you're not a baseball nerd, I really care about this. Uh, the we're get, we're getting so off topic. Uh, we, we never even got on topic. No. Like we we have a topic for this episode. Everyone, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, basically, the short and sweet history of uh, MLB ballparks is that they used to be a downtown location. You know, because that's where a lot of people lived. Uh, usually yeah. had connections to transit, didn't really have a lot of parking. Uh, if you want an example, uh, you can look at, you know, like Yankee Stadium, or old Wrigley Yankee Stadium, Field. Wrigley yeah. Field. Um, you can look at the Polo Grounds, which was in uh, just very North Manhattan. Or you can look at Municipal Stadium in Kansas City, which if you uh, look up a picture of that and look where it is now, there's a, a Google uh, Street View marker that says this is the old site of Municipal Stadium. And really, mm-hmm. it's just a a few houses and uh, empty lots. Yeah. And if you look up a picture of it, it looks like it was actual, like a dense area around it. But with the growing of cars and the urbanization of, uh, you know, sports fans, you had to build large stadiums that had a lot of parking. So if you look at a Truman sports complex or you look at a uh, Shea stadium, for example, or you look at, you know, even Dodger stadium, those are, very absolutely massive ballparks compared to the predecessors in the previous generation, which were usually more smaller affairs. Um, 
Like that's why, you know, Wrigley doesn't have as big of a capacity as something like Kaufman, but they are almost entirely surrounded by a parking lot and they're designed for people to go drive to. Like an affront to God. I'm so excited to see Europeans' opinions on uh, Truman Sports Complex when the World Cup happens. It's it's going to be so great. <laughs> it uh, Let's not go there. It, it, it's going to be embarrassing. Yeah. Uh, I hope we don't embarrass ourselves. But back to the, the ballparks, the nature of baseball and the way that the sport really thrived in what would be referred to as the golden era of baseball is it was a sport directly catered to the being in a city. Because if you play a hundred and something games that you played a hundred and fifty something pre nineteen sixty, and now you pay a hundred and sixty two, you need no one's going to be like I. I'm going to go to a Tuesday game. I'm going to drive my car on the highway, and then I'm going to get a few beers at the game and then drive home. Like mm-hmm. people do do that, but that's a great way to get a DUI. Also, it's a lot less convenient because the whole point of ballparks were to act as like a special event within the neighborhood where people could have a community connection to the baseball team. Yeah, you have that community connection. And before TV, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, here's something to do during the week. You yeah. got off work. Here, go watch a baseball game. They're playing whole season. And it was more like, yeah, community link. The yeah. teams, we weren't as interconnected as we are now. So you were a fan of your local team that was probably pretty close to your neighborhood. Yeah. And with baseball still being 162 games, uh, it is designed to be more cost effective Mm -hmm. you don't have 16 to 18 games like the nfl where in order to afford going you need it's a it's a one-time expense for a lot of americans yeah you if you are able to even make it to an nfl game that's the only time you're going this Mm -hmm. year unless you have season tickets. unless you have season tickets Baseball, on the other hand, is an extremely affordable sport in comparison to most sports, and which is wild because it's a sport with outrageous salaries. I would say there's no; it's not a surprise that baseball was America's pastime up until the advent of television, and people could actually watch NFL games. And that's why baseball has the blackout rules, where if there isn't enough attendance at the games. Uh, local markets can't actually watch it on TV. Uh, but there's recently been a shift. I think that the Baltimore Orioles were the ones to really do this because they were the first, uh, I believe they're the first team to actually build like a modernized, like, but old style ballpark near their downtown. Yeah. And that started off a absolute craze where it became copied all across. Now, I, I believe Bush Stadium was... It, a very old stadium. They just needed a new stadium. They built it literally across the street. They did basically what the Yankees did with new Yankee Stadium, was just build it across the, the street. the Yankees with you, man? Uh, I, it, it's a team I know of. Um, I know. Whereas, uh, and I then... I hate the Yankees. <laughs> and then there's, uh, you know, newer stadiums as well, like Target Field, which is uh, in downtown uh, Minneapolis and does have a transit connection. I have been there. You get right off. Or... Uh, Coors Field, which is as classical of a design as you can get, and also near downtown, mm-hmm. that's the nature. That's where the sport's going. The sports is returning to the place it used to be a part of, except the urban core that was around it has been murdered. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's what John Sherman wants, and that that's the brief history of uh, ballparks. Is if you were curious in that, uh, there are a lot of beautiful ones, and there's some great examples of modern renditions that do it really, really well. Do I believe the Royals will do it well if they have the money to? Yes. I would say if you have something that people want to watch, if you have a good baseball team, Mm -hmm. but there's not a lot of parking in the area, you don't have a gigantic parking lot, people will figure it out, right? Like people are smart. If if you have something that's worth watching and people want like the Chiefs, if you put a Chiefs stadium in Power and Light, you replace the Mm -hmm. T-Mobile Center, no more parking spots. It's still like the way it is. People would go. People would park 10 blocks out and walk. You know, people would want to go see it. Or they would want to ride a transit network near their house so you don't even have to drive their car. Yeah. Uh, and also that would allow you to uh, do the thing that I really like uh, would like to do, which is uh, get absolutely loaded and still interact with my surroundings. Yeah, as there a is nothing in more American than getting absolutely blitzed at a sporting event. But right now, uh, in most of the country... You would have to commit a crime to get home, <laughs> and that's and that's un-American. It, it is, uh, and 
with baseball also at the pitch clock now being basically an hour and a half and the cutoff point where they no longer sell beer being pushed forward and forward into the game mm -hmm. um there's you know really there's no excuse to actually engage in buying alcohol on a tuesday night royals game mm -hmm. if i don't have a transit network to ride back on also if the royals weren't charging me 35 dollars for a ba beer bat yeah but if John Sherman, with his new proposal, comes out with an actual solid plan and uh, Kansas City is willing to uh, support it with uh, not funding it entirely, but at least providing the resources for it, and John Sherman is willing to both invest in the team and have an actual proposal that in connects it to transit, also provides affordable housing and a uh, downtown park district that is affordable it could be something that people could get on. Yeah. It's just so far, John Sherman and the Royals have had been absolutely awful at the PR of it. It's like, if you build it, they will come, right? Mm -hmm. If if you, if, and that's the thing is we always have to, and I get, it's like a large investment for like public transit infrastructure projects and stuff. But largely, if you build like a really effective, you know, runs reliably, whatever, train from point A to point B, and point A is where people in general live, and point B is where people in general work, businesses will want to go to point B because it's like, hey, that's really convenient, and people will want to live at point A mm -hmm. because, hey, that's really convenient. Because at the end of the day, public transit networks are successful because driving is kind of boring, and having to do it every single morning is kind of annoying. Yeah. And you have to spend a lot of money on gas. And if you still, if you love your car, you can still drive your car. That's the point where just at least humanizing the environment to where, like, if I want to go to a Royals game and get absolutely loaded and spend $400 on John Sherman's expensive wheat juice, uh, I want to be able to at least get home safely and legally. We need Congress to pass the National Getting Drunk at Baseball Games Act where they finance a public transit network they, around every single baseball stadium they, so we can get drunk at baseball games like our forefathers see, did. You, you, you say that, but I believe Congress did pass a Save America's Pastime bill before... <laughs> To help save the MLB from like and give them like some tax breaks. I don't exactly know the details of it, but I they're the nation's only legal monopoly, other than the other monopolies that exist, like Amazon. They're the nation's only federally mandated monopoly. We need <laughs> we need we need to bring back five cent beer. We need a federally subsidized nickel beer night. Uh, it, no, but maybe like five dollar beer night might be more reasonable. Uh, <laughs> Nickel beer night would be a lot of fun, but Nickel beer night was a disaster in the seventies. Yes, <laughs> it was a disaster in the seventies. Imagine what it would do today. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, have you ever? Speaking of sports, um, you ever think Missouri is going to legalize sports betting? I think that they will. They will. I think they will. We got they got weed. They're definitely going to do sports betting, especially because much like you know Kansas and weed. You can do it across the state. Mm -hmm. you, you can already sports bet, and it's not that big of a deal. Nobody's died. You know, like, we don't suddenly have a Kansas City Mafia again. Yeah. So I don't think it's going to be that big of a problem. Speaking of, the Kansas City Mafia is actually in uh, the movie Casino. Have you ever seen Casino? I have not seen Casino. I need to get back up on my Scorsese movies. Casino rocks, and uh, there's a lot of, like, uh, parts of Kansas City in it. I don't think it was filmed in kansas city but it does involve like the basically not to spoil a casino a movie that came out probably 30 years ago i haven't even ago. seen it so you're gonna spoil it for me all right never, never mind <laughs> but i was gonna say but a uh crucial point of it involves uh mob connections in kansas city and this is why uh we have our main uh story for today this is uh from casey yesterday uh, about the rise and fall of Kansas City's River Kwai, a tale of ambition, mafia infiltration, and tainted legacy. Okay. So the, the cover photo is, it looks like Berlin in 1945 or London in 1945. It's just like... I'd like to figure out where this is. And uh, R R River Kwai is a, uh, a old name for the river market. This is the River Market. Jam um, Volker and Co. We could probably find that building. We, we can probably find this image of uh, where the uh, main climax of the story yeah. is showing. The Obviously, the article will be linked below, yeah. and you can click on it to see the photo we're talking about or anything else. If you want to read the article, support the author. Yes. Uh, and for it is, at a glance, 
Marion D. Uh, Trizolio, why did I why did I pick and why did I pick one that involved names that I couldn't pronounce? It's it's got bullet points too. I saw you pause for the bullet point. Like, how am I gonna say that? Marion A. Trizolo founded the River Quay in 1971, refurbishing abandoned buildings and encouraging businesses to set up shop in the area. Fred Harvey, oh God, Bonadonna opened Poor Freddy's in the River Quay and helped establish the district's wholesome vision. The Savella family became interested in the River Quay after learning about its profitability, leading to mafia-owned establishments attempting to gain access to the area. Joe and Willie... Camisano sought to restore the River Kwai to its original state as a red light district, leading to conflict with Bonadonna and ultimately resulting in his fleeing the city in the uh, explosions that occurred in 1977. Uh, the violence and mafia related conflict ruined the River Kwai and left behind a tainted legacy. And this is from Stories from the City. Uh, in the 1970s, Kansas City's River Kwai was a major attraction. On May 27th, 1977, however, it became the setting of one of the largest mafia-related attacks in the city, which was predicated to be the beginning of the end for the Kwai. But before the mafia had infiltrated, it was one of the most renowned spots in the area. It was all thanks to a man named Marion D. Trezolio and his ambition. In 1971, Trezolio, a professor at Rockhurst University, moved to Kansas City from Chicago founded the River Kwai. He had a plastics business, which inspired him to purchase the first of the historic buildings in the abandoned area. Subsequently, subsequently, he bought 20 more properties and refurbished them for rental to business owners for 2 or $3 more, 2 or $3 per square foot, thus encouraging business to set up shop in the area. He envisioned the River Kwai as to become like Old Town in Chicago or the French Quarter in New Orleans. By the mid-1970s, River Kwai had grown to include 65 businesses. The River Kwai was quickly gaining attention in Kansas City, and it drew the attention of entrepreneur Fred Harvey Banandola, known as Freddie. Despite his father being a mafia associate, he urged Banandola to take a different route. As a result, in September 15, 1972, Banandola opened a business, Poor Freddy's, and it was an immediate success. Banandola a firm believer in the wholesome vision of the River Kwai. Uh, there were, there were there was no loud music, no liquor joints that didn't serve food, and no adult entertainment. I was struggling with trying to wrap my head around the wholesome vision when it, it sounded like a bar, but really it's just bar and grills with uh, no yeah, loud music yeah. and no adult entertainment, which they mentioned it was a red light district. So I guess like, it, this is just a bunch of like sports bars, basically. Yeah, sports bars. I think um, maybe maybe it was before this. Maybe it transitioned into like a sports bar district. Yeah, I mean, it, red it, lights like strip clubs and stuff, right? It, yeah, it yeah, prostitutes. Yeah, which is real weird to think of the River Market as a former prostitute district turned almost completely abandoned, turned into like a burgeoning thing that is now kind of what it is. Day. Yeah, it's kind of cool. It's kind of cool, like a little yeah. farmer's market. Banandola, although not connected to the mafia, had frequent encounters with them. His success prompted him to boast to a member of the Sevilla family that he was earning $10,000 per week, which is an exaggeration. This was significant as Nick Sevilla headed the Kansas City Mafia, making the Sevilla family formidable. When Sevilla heard that investing in the River Kwai could be so profitable, he became interested. In consequence, the mafia-owned establishments that served alcohol hosted adult entertainment and attempted to gain access to the River Kwai. These included the X-rated Chelsea Kwai Theater, Delaware Daddies, Three Little Pigs, and other mob-related bars. Let's bring back Delaware Daddies. I, mean, I want to go to the Three Little Pigs, actually. Yeah. <laughs> that could be cool if, like, a, like, a neon sign with three pigs, like, drinking beer or whatever. That could be cool, yeah. That we need could to, be cool. We, we need, need to, to f- return to our roots. Re- return to the roots. I, I am sure that this is uh, either a parking lot or a, uh, like, a thrift store oh, or something. Oh, it's absolutely else. like a parking lot right now. They probably just, the building was probably perfectly fine, and they yeah. paved over it for tax reasons, I'm sure. Despite this, Banandola was still devoted to his vision of the district's wholesomeness and tried to keep these businesses out. 
Joe Camisano and his brother Willie were significant tr- contributors to the downfall of the River Kwai. Joe had previously managed the girly joints along the West 12th Street strip in Kansas City, and he reminisced about the Kwai's past as a red light district. He sought to restore it to his original state. But Banandola was determined to prevent this from happening. He attempted to block the Camanzanos from obtaining liquor licenses, which angered them and made Banandola a target. Furthermore, Banandola owned parking lots near the Kwai that the Casamanos desired. See, that's like traditional Kansas City culture. Everybody in the city owns a parking lot. Yeah. That's what you got to do. State-sanctioned parking and lots. If anybody tries to take your parking lot by God... <laughs> well, you're going to read about it. <laughs> yeah. In July of 76, David Banandola was tragically found dead in the trunk of a car. <laughs> <laughs> Man, d- d- don't brag about earning $10,000 a week to the mob boss. Just I telling everybody, hey, by the way, I am completely loaded. <laughs> <laughs> I am completely loaded. And when you guys try and get in here, I'm going to box you out. Yeah. Right before his demise, he warned his son, Freddie, that he would be targeted after him. Abruptly, Freddie fell in the city in February of 1977, slightly before the explosion that occurred on the River Kwai. On March 27th, 1977, an explosion occurred which completely destroyed two bars owned by the Banandola brothers. Although no one was injured, an investigating federal agent noted that 10 times the amount of explosives needed were used, leading them to believe it was meant to be a warning. This event was a start of many crises crises that the River Kwai was to face. And it was Fred Banandola who would ultimately testify against Joe and Willie Camanzano, resulting in them being placed into witness protection. Mm. Ten times the amount of explosives were needed. (laughs) How have I never heard about this? I don't know. Uh, we well, Kansas City mob stories are uh, slept on. I guess in the seventies you had like a lot of other stuff going on. Yeah, considering that what is now a kind of popping off area of Kansas City was a red light district, now abandoned, t- turned like newly developed. I guess half the issue mm-hmm. of this whole thing is the uh, stigma, and I'm guessing they probably don't want to bring that back up. No. In March 1977, Banandola's war for control over the River Kwai resulted in an explosion that it, I've already ever read that. No. Uh, no, you haven't read that right. one. Resulted in an explosion that demolished two bars. This event symbolizes the conflicts between the original business owners of the River Kwai, who desired a family-oriented atmosphere, and the Mafia, who intended to convert the area into a red-light district. The Mafia attempts to seize power, along with the violence accompanying it, ruin one of Kansas City's most beloved sites, and has left behind a tainted tragedy. The name River Kwai... Scarcely uttered by Kansas City natives, except for in reference to Kwai Coffee, a local coffee house. If you enjoyed this story, you can learn about Kansas City's captivating history every week with Stories from the City, an exclusive newsletter from KC Yesterday. Please go sign up for them. Uh, they talk about mafia, architecture, prohibition, sports, and everything in between. Yeah. And uh, this is courtesy of thecleo.org uh, with we, uh, a uh, C, not a uh, K like might us. might need to get in contact with our attorneys. Are they here before us? They, they were 100% here before us. You think so? <laughs> yes. Hold on. Thecleo.org. What are you guys about Clio? Oh, it's like an actual cool website. Never mind. You yeah. guys can go check them out. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Casey, yesterday for uh, the ability to read this story. And I'm actually curious uh, where that actually was. So let's go ahead and try and find the street. It looks like it was just north of the river, actually, based on this really terrible tourist There's an map. address. There's an address? Yeah, look at the bottom. Well, that's the Kansas City. That's the Visitor Bureau of Greater oh. Kansas City in Baltimore. River Quay. Uh, can you look up the uh, Quay Coffee House to see if we can uh, figure yeah, out where we're that's located? This out for all of y'all. We are uh, doing research live. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> but and I'm just curious on uh, just it, it, if any of these, like, if we could find what happened to those buildings that got blown up. Um, I think they got. I think they got destroyed oh. in an explosion. Yeah, know, probably. It, it's, see, that map was so bad because the, the star was north of the Missouri, and it is the yeah. River Market. 
Yeah, Kwai River. It's right next to Betty Ray's Ice Cream. On yeah, the it, it's on Delaware. I, I think the address is that because it, the, it was on Delaware, the address that was on the bottom of that ad. Was that like Volker Building still here? I mean, that's... Okay, Here here's a building from across the street that's very clearly older. Is it... Can you see it in these photos? I mean... If, if we're assuming what that if we Delaware. can if we can blow up this Kansas City Times article and maybe we can see an address, perhaps I'm assuming this ha- picture of the block of filled with cars has to be the block, right? Uh, I hope. Yeah, this used to be a lot denser. This area, yeah, there was a lot more back in the day. Well, I mean, when you set off a car bomb in it, I mean, yeah, it tends to kind of push people away from it, huh? Yeah, absolutely. The block 15 Tavern. I mean, the River Market. If you're ever in Kansas City, if you ever want to go. You know, visit. It is a cool area, especially if you go on the weekend. It is a wait, Volker, Volker. That's it. That's the building. You can see it right there. We are a Volker for those following Co. along. We are giving you some street signs. We are at um, uh, Delaware and yeah, it was right there, Volker and Co. See it right there, hmm. Liam Volker and Co. So that Liam, if you look, if you pull up the article right now, the picture on the top, the very top of the photo, it says. Like Liam Volker and Co. And that is on uh, what road is this? We I believe we're on Third uh, and Delaware. Yeah, Third and Delaware, looking northeast. You can actually still see that building; it still exists. So that must be just about where the explosion happened. Probably down Third, right? Yeah. Because if you're looking at that angle, it had to be been like Third and Wyandot, is my guess. Huh. Just looking at that angle, because then you got this through road right here, Wyandot. That's probably that. I mean, it's not a T junction, but maybe maybe Second Street. That's a T junction. I think I think that that's it, as long as they didn't completely redo these roads back in the day. It must be like Third and Second in Kansas City. Oh, is where this explosion happened. Well, there we go, guys. Uh, we've kind of done some detective work on a uh, seldom talked about mob story. I'm curious on. What someone who was alive during the 1970s, who is a Casey native, would say about that? Yeah, I wonder if it was actually that picked up or if it was just kind of like a side article compared to other things that were happening. Yeah. Like, what else was happening in 1977? It's really nothing. Right? I mean, the lingering issues with the oil crisis. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy Carter was just elected president. Um Yeah. Stagflation. Stagflation. Uh, I mean, that that was like the big serial killer boom, right? Yeah. Thanks, led gasoline. <laughs> Thanks, led gasoline. Yeah. Oh, well, well, there you go. That's a little piece of Kansas City history that not that many people know about unless you were alive in 1977, probably. That's cool. Yeah. Too bad this article does not have an actual author anywhere. That's kind of weird. We would love to credit you. Yeah. Seriously, if you if you hear this podcast and you wrote this article, please email us and we will put your name on the episode and credit you because I don't see a name anywhere. It's a pretty well good article. So Anyway, I I really just enjoyed it because I was trying to hunt for something to talk about for this episode. We're, we're getting into the uh, logistics. No, of this. we we totally have everything planned out like months in advance. Yes, yeah. it, it. I totally didn't like try and find something interesting about the Kansas City area to talk about this episode. See, we have this problem, all right, where we're trying to find a topic, and then we spend 20 minutes talking about baseball before we actually get to the topic we found. You know? Yeah. It's never an issue because we always just sit down and we just naturally talk about something. We just always feel like we have to have some form of like central focal point, which I guess is how you structure a good podcast, right? But Yeah. But I thought this was interesting, and I really wish uh, there was more info on the Kansas City mob. I, I think I can do a deep dive into that um, because there's probably information about it. I mean, let's Shoot, yeah, we could do... The mobs of Kansas City. That could be a good episode idea. That would be a good episode. If, if TM, TM, we're doing that. Yeah, we're doing do, that. Don't, do, don't do, fucking do, take that. That's, that's our ours. idea. That's our idea. Anyways. Yeah. Like 35 minutes. All right. Well, I guess we have a, a short one. Yeah, a little short. A short little nugget. Easier, right. to, easier to listen to, you know? Well, this has been uh, Cleo Talk. I've been Matt. And I've been RC. Uh, we need to work on our uh, name thing. Uh, we have... Our each, name thing? Yeah. We're, we're, there are three different names. Anyway, uh... I've been Matt. Uh, that's been RC. Uh, you can go to follow us on Twitter. RC. Follow us on Twitter. 
at Clio History. You can email us at cleohistorypodcast at gmail.com. You can go leave us a review and a like and a share. That really helps us in the algorithm stuff. And yeah, Just uh, let us know what you think of the episodes. Yes. Uh, we, uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.